Today, headlines of rapid evolution pop up all the time and are wielded by Bible skeptics and online visitors to our comment sections constantly as undeniable proof of the story of evolution. However, when you dig just a little deeper, all these examples fail spectacularly as to what evolutionists need to demonstrate. For those who can appreciate slapstick comedy alongside some rapid-fire dialogue, the classic 1953 comedy routine, Who's On First, performed by the famous Abbott and Costello, stands out as a brilliant performance that's stood the test of time. The entire premise of the skit lies in the confusion that arises because of the lack of understanding of the definition of terms being used between the two of them while discussing a baseball game. Abbott tries to explain to Costello the last names of the players on the baseball team, who, what, and I don't know. Costello is confounded by the switch up of the words being used in their natural sense as questions and or declarations rather than the supposed proper names of the fictional players. I'm asking you who's on first. That's the man's name. That's whose name? Yeah. And it all gets very amusing and confusing when they discuss who is on first, what is on second, and I don't know is on third base, all with a blisteringly fast delivery that showcases their comedic intelligence quite dynamically. Of course, as amusing as the confusion is when watching the comedy routine, in real life situations, especially when dealing with important issues, Talking past one another because of a lack of definition in terms is often very frustrating and detrimental to building understanding between different parties. And this is very common amongst creationists and evolutionists discussing the origins debate, especially when biblical creationists use the English translation of the Hebrew word min, which means kind, when describing animal kinds, alongside modern terms like genus and species, etc. And what do I mean by that? Well, biblical creationists believe what the book of Genesis clearly reveals, that God created distinct kinds of animals to reproduce after their own kind, and use terminology, such as the term baramin, that reflects this belief. The word baramin comes from two Hebrew words, bara meaning created and min meaning kind. So baramin literally means created kind. And the study of the biblical animal kinds is called baraminology. The idea of animals reproducing after their kind connotes the idea that in a plain sense, as examples, the dog kind will only reproduce and make more dogs. And when the cat or the elephant or whale kind produce offspring, they will only result in more cats or elephants or whales, respectively, etc. Biblical creationists don't believe that one kind of creature will ever evolve into another, no matter how long they might reproduce. However, this leads to the question, what exactly is a kind? Because we see a tremendous amount of variety in just the cat or dog types, for example. How do we explain where lions and tigers and tabby cats, along with wolves and foxes and French poodles come from, let alone the incredible variety of all the other plants and animals we see, if God created individual kinds in the beginning? Wouldn't all that variety coming about support the story of evolution rather than the idea of some manner of fixity between different sorts of animals? Well, no, because by our modern classification system, a baramin would most likely fit at the family level. And in case it's been a while since you took high school science, you might remember the classification system is based on similarities in obvious physical traits in creatures and consists of a hierarchy of taxa, from the kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, down to the species. So, for example, most creation scientists would assume that Noah didn't need to have pairs of coyotes or foxes or dingoes or dachshunds and a large number of other present-day species representative of the dog kind, which fall under the family classification Canidae, but rather a pair of creatures on board which contained the genetic diversity to account for all these species on board Noah's Ark. Interestingly, there are around 500 dog breeds around the world. And amazingly, the vast majority of these dog breeds are less than 500 years old. And most of them are fewer than 150 years old. And evolutionists have admitted that all modern dog breeds have been bred from wolves, which means wolves are likely very similar to the parent dog kind 
that Noah took aboard and then exited from the ark after the Genesis flood. The origin of the domestic dog from wolves has been established, suggesting a common origin from a single gene pool for all dog populations. Just this example alone begs the question, how can simply breeding dogs cause us to see genetic changes that produce so many dog varieties in such a short time? Well, there are really only two possible explanations for the elegantly complex programmed genetic systems we observe in nature. The vast majority of variation in kinds of animals has either come about through the slow addition of novel individual traits over millions of years, and this is what the story of evolution professes, or either through the divvying up and expression of subsets of pre-existing genetic information that was front-loaded into the genomes of all the different kinds of creatures God made in the beginning. And this is what biblical creationists believe. And everything we've observed in science supports that idea, such as the example of the variety of dog types from wolves demonstrates. Interestingly, National Geographic made our point for us in an article discussing the supposed evolution of dogs when they said, genetic studies show that dogs evolved from wolves and remain as similar to the creatures from which they came as humans with different physical characteristics are to each other, which is to say, not much difference at all. Well, if we took random samples of people from Europe, Asia, North and South America, or Africa, despite any genetic differences, they would all be considered people, human beings. And if we take various dog types from all around the world, they're all still dogs. So all we've ever observed scientifically is exactly what the Bible says. The various kinds of creatures we study around the world reproduce according to their kinds. As confusing as terms creationists use might seem to evolutionists, we also find that evolutionists often confuse definitions when discussing what we see in biology in relation to the story of evolution as well. For example, it's quite common for the average evolution believer to point to present-day examples of new species of animals arising as observational examples of the story of evolution occurring in real time. However, these examples fit the biblical creation model perfectly. Rapid speciation has always been a cornerstone of young earth creationist belief. Why? Because if all the present day animals we observe are descended from the limited number, approximately 1400, of the various air breathing kinds of creatures that went aboard and exited Noah's Ark, then rapid speciation must have occurred since then to account for the diversity of kinds we see today. Creationists have pointed out for a long time now that big picture evolution is the idea that pond scum has slowly become protozoa, pine trees, parrots, pandas, and eventually people over millions of years. And if it were true, it must have involved natural processes which would require increases in never before seen genetic information for forms, functions, and features that never existed before. Obviously, if lizard-like creatures somehow turned into birds over millions of years, then that lizard-like creature must have gained substantive increases in genetic information that provided new functional complexity for wings, feathers, preening glands, flight navigation systems, and a myriad of other features that birds have but lizards don't. However, this is not the case in what we see when new species arise. These new species only have subsets and rearrangements of genetic information from the parent species from which they came, not never before seen genetic information for brand new functions. So how can they be seen as examples of what the story of evolution proposes, especially when these examples fit beautifully within the biblical creation model? To put it simply, Moths turning into moths, finches turning into finches, and fruit flies turning into varieties of fruit flies is not what most people think of when considering the story of evolution. The general theory of evolution is the idea that there was a supposed first life form that somehow arose from non-life and gained more and more unique forms, functions, and features over a vast amount of time, producing every living thing that has ever been. And this general theory of evolution 
was clearly stated by the famous evolutionist Kirkut in his Implications of Evolution. The theory that all the living forms in the world have arisen from a single source, which itself came from an inorganic form. Now, some evolutionists have accused biblical creations of changing their beliefs about speciation now, because the undeniable evidence from science has demonstrated that the idea of fixity of species has been overturned. And thus, creationists have only recently been forced to shift the goalposts regarding rapid speciation, to adapt their beliefs to changing times. However, beliefs about what the word species means could have only first begun when the term was first coined. And the word species was created, alongside much of our modern classification system we use today, by the biblical creationist Carolus Linnaeus. Linnaeus, who passed away in 1778, was a Swedish biologist and physician who formalized binomial nomenclature, the modern system of naming organisms. Now, although Linnaeus began with a basic concept of biblical created kinds and initially believed in the fixity of species in that sense, i.e. that God had created separate kinds of creatures that would not turn into other kinds, as he continued his research and observed various examples of hybridization occurring, he realized that God's created kinds should be identified categorically above the species level. It's clear that Linnaeus always believed in variation within the biblical kinds, and he referred to these changes as varieties. In his own words, regarding plants, for example, the number of varieties is the number of differing plants that are produced from the seed of the same species. So, despite some critics latching onto quotes from some of his earlier work and strawmanning him and other creationists as having believed in fixity of species, by the time he died, Linnaeus had modified his view based on observational science of the created kind from the species level to roughly where it is today, essentially identical to the modern creationist view. And this is well documented from his own works and acknowledged by honest evolutionists. Linnaeus proposed that dog, wolf, and fox belonged to the same created genus, and that they were products of hybridization. It's even been acknowledged that Darwin knew of Linnaeus's conclusions as well. The great Swedish botanist had later in life changed his view of the fixity of species, and integrated further experience with his basic concept of creation, to accommodate his opinion about the created original kinds. Darwin was quite surprised when he was told that Linnaeus had changed his mind. So it's simply disingenuous for evolutionists to accuse modern creationists of having changed their views recently regarding these concepts, when Linnaeus, known as the father of modern taxonomy, the creator of the word species, didn't believe the word species designated the biblical created kind. But just to be fair, I've seen modern-day creationists also use the word species incorrectly as interchangeable with the word kind as well. Like Abbott and Costello, it often really comes down to the terminology simply being used incorrectly for the concepts trying to be conveyed. So who gets it? Why shouldn't he? The fact is, new species of animals arising are being observed constantly, which is tremendous support for the biblical creation model. Although we would expect that the most intense period of diversification of each of the kinds of animals that came off Noah's Ark to have occurred immediately following the Flood, as a wide variety of ecological niches and challenging environmental conditions would trigger adaptations through natural selection, epigenetic activation, and a wide variety of other mechanisms, the fact that it still occurs often today and with great rapidity is great support for what the Bible teaches. Why? because evolutionists have up until recently expected that speciation would be something that would occur over very long periods of time and would therefore be extremely rare and hardly ever observed. However, examples of rapid speciation are now commonplace. Evolutionists often make a big deal about new species coming about as examples of evolution and emphasize the point that the new species can't mate with the parent species as proof. However, breeding barriers between species can arise through genetic mutations that don't add any functional information whatsoever. 
An example comes from two forms of ferment flies, Drosophila, that produce offspring that were technically a new biological species, as they couldn't breed with the parent species. They were virtually indistinguishable from them and obviously the same kind as the parents, <laughs> since they came from them, but simply couldn't produce offspring with them. And this was due to a slight chromosomal rearrangement, not any new genetic information in their DNA. Think of DNA like a library of books, instruction manuals that contain everything about a creature and how to put it together and maintain it. Each library or genome has books of information we call chromosomes. Each book, chromosome, of information has chapters in them made up of sentences we call genes. And the chapters are groups of genes that are read in a coordinated way. So what happened to these flies is akin to having someone mistakenly rearrange the books in your library, not write out brand new books of information and adding them to your library, which is what the story of evolution would have to demonstrate if it were to be considered supported by repeatable, observable operational science. Today, headlines of rapid evolution pop up all the time and are wielded by Bible skeptics and online visitors to our comment sections constantly as undeniable proof of the story of evolution. However, when you dig just a little deeper, all these examples fail spectacularly as to what evolutionists need to demonstrate. For example, when researchers in Trinidad relocated some guppy fish from a water pool full of predators to other pools containing only one known predator that because of its size could prey only on smaller guppies, the descendants of the transplanted guppies adjusted by growing bigger, maturing later, and having fewer and bigger offspring. The rapidity of these changes stunned the evolution-believing researchers because the standard dogma is that evolution requires long periods of time for creatures to adapt. And this was demonstrated by one of the scientists who commented, the guppies adapted to their new environment in a mere four years, a rate of change some 10,000 to 10 million times faster than the average rates determined from the fossil record. But notice, the guppies are still guppies. They don't have any forms, functions, or features that weren't in the parent population, etc. All that happened is that guppies that produce smaller offspring were selected out of the environment, and those that contained the genetics to produce larger ones survived better. But the genetics for largeness already existed in the parent population before the environment was changed. So, once again, despite all the confusion in terms and miscommunication regarding the story of evolution we see, all we've ever observed scientifically is exactly what the Bible says. The various kinds of creatures we study around the world reproduce according to their kinds. So, if you want to believe that one kind will magically morph into another over hundreds of thousands of years, then you believe it on faith, not observational science. <laughs>